Hi everyone, um, in this session we are going to discuss unsupervised learning algorithms, um, specifically k-means and hierarchical clustering methods. So uh, let's start with uh, the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, just here on the left uh, we have an example of supervised learning for classification, uh, where both features and targets are known and uh, in which the main goal is to find a rule or model uh, that assigns labels to new points. Uh, so for instance, here in the figure, we can observe two groups and the labels that were, that were assigned uh, based on this uh, surface uh, or decision boundary. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for uh, unsupervised learning, only features are known. So that means that there are no uh, labels involved. And uh, in this case, the main purpose is to uh, group objects together based on similarities. So here in this figure, we can observe two very clear groups. Um, and this can help us to find uh, patterns uh, in the data that we don't really know. So now I'm going to discuss uh, the general and supervised learning process. Uh, here's the overall workflow and process of unsupervised learning. So uh, we begin with our input raw data. Um, here uh, we don't have any output response or label um, associated with our data. Uh, so we basically begin with interpretation, data mining, and data analysis um, of the data that we have. There's no training involved. Uh, then we apply an algorithm that can help us to group or find uh, unknown patterns in the data, uh, such as k-means or agglomerative clustering. Um, so this is basically the model training step. Uh, we fit um, our model and predict our model, and then we obtain um, our output that is going to be um, groups or subgroups of our data uh, and each one of these groups are related to the specific uh, characteristics or patterns that um, the algorithm found in the data. Um, uh, so for instance, in this case, we got three subgroups that were associated with three types of fruits. Um, so that means that this was um, very useful in order to find uh, patterns associated with characteristics. So now I'm going to explain uh, the k-means progress or steps involved in k-means clustering. Uh, so first of all, we randomly uh, assign a number from 1 to k to each of the observations. Uh, so we basically here assign uh, initial cluster assignments. So for instance, uh, in this case, we have three cluster and each one of the observation has um, a cluster assignment. Uh, this K would be yellow, pink, or green. Then uh, what we do is that we iterate until the cluster assignments stop changing. Uh, so first uh, we uh, compute for each one of the clusters, we compute the cluster centroid here in this step. And then we just assign each observation to the cluster whose centroid is closest. So for instance, all of these data points are associated with the yellow cluster because they are closer to this centroid. Then we repeat this process over and over and over until um, there's no change uh, in the uh, cluster assignments. So for instance, this is our final results for three uh, clusters. One important question that we need to make is how to choose the optimal number of clusters. Uh, there are two methods that we can use, the elbow plot and silhouette score for k-means clustering that can help us uh, to obtain or to determine the, the accurate, the most accurate uh, number of clusters. However, this is uh, still uh, a very subjective um, process uh, for k-means clustering. So in this case, we have the elbow plot. This is the uh, first method. Uh, where we basically estimate the within cluster variation here. And we select the value of k 
at the elbow at the elbow or it's just the point after which the inertia here starts decreasing in a linear uh, fashion uh, basically uh, the inertia decreases um, as the number of clusters increases uh, which makes sense uh, since the more clusters we have we have a, a greater homogeneity among observations on each uh, cluster. So this is, can be a very useful method to determine um, the optimal uh, number of clusters. Um, another important method that we can use is the silhouette score. Um, in this case, uh, we basically uh, analyze the separation distance between the resulting uh, clusters and we just select uh, the values of K with highest average silhouette scores and a similar cluster size. So we basically check if every single cluster has uh, relatively uh, the same uh, cluster size or same number of data points on each one of these clusters. So there are two conditions for this. Um, the main reason why we uh, obtain or calculate the silhouette score is because uh, sometimes uh, this elbow plow is not very clear. Uh, we can have um, elbow plots where we don't really uh, observe that clear uh, point um, after we have that linear fashion way. So you can have um, a behavior uh, like this and in this case we don't have that that uh, a clear change in the uh, inertia uh, plot so now let's discuss um, another important clustering method called hierarchical clustering um, in this approach we don't really uh, require to pre-specify the specific number of clusters so uh, the good thing about this is that um, we can choose how many clusters we will like after doing the hierarchical clustering. Um, uh, this uh, results in a very attractive uh, tree-based uh, representation of observations that you can observe here. Uh, this is called the endogram. Um, and again, how I mentioned before, uh, we can choose the number of clusters after uh, running uh, the clustering algorithm. Um, here we can observe how our data are grouped um, and the different clusterings that we can obtain in our data. So now, how do we interpret the dendrogram? Each leaf of these uh, dendrograms represents one of the observations that you can see here. So as we move up to the tree, basically some of the leaves uh, begin to fuse into branches, as you can see here. So this is a branch, this is another branch, and this is another branch. Uh, this uh, corresponds to observations that are similar to each other. That's why they are grouped and are fused up uh, on these specific branches. Um, the earlier um, uh, fusions occur, the more similar uh, the groups of observations are to each other. Um, on the other hand, observations that fuse later here um, can be uh, quite different from one another. Uh, so in practice, uh, people um, often look at the dendrogram and select by eye, just by looking uh, how many clusters uh, can we obtain uh, based just on the heights of these uh, fusions and the clusters that we want to have. Um, so uh, it's, it's a very subjective uh, task, uh, even though we have the construction of the dendrogram. So now I'm going to briefly explain uh, the agglomerative clustering uh, progress or steps. Uh, first of all, uh, we begin with uh, n observations and we basically uh, measure all of the pairwise dissimilarities between each of the observations, uh, where we treat each observation as uh, its own cluster. Um, so again, we examine all pairwise intercluster dissimilarities that we obtained in the previous steps. 
and we just identify the pair that pair of clusters or observations that are most similar to each other. So in this case, we have uh, seven and five, and what we do is that we fuse these two observations into one cluster. Then uh, we compute uh, a new uh, pairwise intercluster dissimilarity, and we fused uh, then to obtain uh, a new cluster. Um, and we do this uh, for each one of the um, uh, observations um, uh, in order to obtain uh, different branches um, in our dendrogram. So, for instance, let's uh, kind of repeat the process or the overall process. So we have here the n observations. Each one of them is uh, their own cluster. Then we um, identify the pair of clusters based on uh, intercluster dissimilarities that are most similar to each other. And then we just fuse them together. And then we compute this process all over again for other pairwise, pairwise intercluster dissimilarity. Um, in order to obtain another cluster. Uh, and we repeat this process all over and over again. So in this case, we have uh, just a clear one cluster, then in here we have two clusters, and then here we have again two clusters uh, when where five, seven, and eight are grouped together in just one branch. Um, one important aspect is uh, how to compute all pairwise dissimilarities. So there are four types of dissimilarities that we can uh, apply um, in order to uh, compute and obtain uh, the um, clusters and branches. Um, so we have single where uh, the where the intercluster dissimilarity is uh, computed as the minimal distance between um, between uh, groups, between points in the groups. Uh, we have complete, where is the maximal uh, intercluster uh, dissimilarity or the maximal distance between uh, uh, points in our clusters. Then we have the mean uh, intercluster dissimilarity, where we want to find what is the mean on each other and obtain uh, the distance between them. And then it can also be um, obtain it through uh, centroids, uh, where it is uh, obtained by uh, calculating the centroid for cluster A and here the uh, centroid for cluster B. Finally, here are the references uh, that I use for this presentation. Um, here I highly recommend uh, this book, uh, An Introduction to Statistical Learning with Applications in R. Um, it provides uh, very useful examples of our implementation. Um, and if not, uh, you can also use this book, Hanson uh, Unsupervised Learning Using Python, um, someone that uses Python. So um, it provides a lot of examples and implementations um, of uh, unsupervised uh, learning algorithms, uh, but by using Python. Uh, thank you. Um, I will explain also an example um, uh, of uh, unsupervised learning, uh, specifically um, k-means and agglomerative clustering uh, using uh, Python. Uh, this will be in the second part of the uh, video.